Seminarau ar-lein adran y Gymraeg ac astudiaeth y Celtaidd Prifysgol Aberystwyth. Karen Jankulak. What can hagiography tell us about medieval connections between Wales, Cornwall and Brittany? 27th of February 2024. Yeah, okay, well, um, and that, Chris saw a bow, a man is um, and I go um, a seminar and Hokan a semester home and after the Gumbrai previous call Aberystwyth. Uh, welcome to you all uh, here in Aberystwyth and uh, those of you who are joining us from afar uh, through the miracles of technology. Um, and welcome to the first of our research seminars this uh, semester um, here in the Department of Welsh and Celtic Studies in Aberystwyth. And we're very pleased to welcome Karen as our first speaker this um, semester. Um, Karen is now a colleague of ours in um, the School of Languages and Literatures, or, or something like that, that we are now part of, along with the um, Department of Modern Languages, which is the home of the Anglo-Norman Dictionary, which is where um, Karen uh, works. Um, now, I um, first encountered Karen and her work because I come from a part of, or was brought up in a part of North Devon, where there are uh, dedications to St. Petrock, who was the subject of uh, Karen's um, PhD, um, which she did in uh, Toronto in the um, uh, Celtic Studies department there, um, which was published in 2000 in the medieval cult of St. Petrock. Um, after which uh, she worked on the Dictionary of Old English at the University of Toronto uh, and then uh, went to the School of Celtic Studies in the Dublin Institute uh, before coming to Wales in 1999 uh, to lecture at what was then the University of Wales Lampetus. Now I've got an even longer uh, name than that. Um, and um, she was... Um, lecturing in the departments of Welsh uh, history and uh, theology. She left the university in 2013 uh, to care for her disabled son and to work in disability advocacy. And um, she has been um, here in Aberystwyth uh, since uh, September uh, of last year. We're very, very pleased to have her um, here uh, with us and uh, to be able to call upon her to do uh, things like this. So um, I shan't take up any more time, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Simon. Uh, Jeff, thank you, uh, Eric, uh, for the lovely, um, the lovely poster and the invitation. Um have this yarn and what am I? And I'm very regretful that I'm not able to deliver such a presentation, and I'm like, um, uh, I hope to be in the future. <clears throat> and I also apologize in advance because the subject of my talk is largely to do with medieval Brittany and also Cornwall uh, and Wales. There might be some parts that people are already familiar with, but I'm going to explain it if you're not. Um, and there will be parts that you will possibly mm -hmm. not be familiar with and I will try to take that into account because we're covering a very large area and one that is slightly underserved in English language Celtic studies, which is to say Brittany, although there's a very thriving, um, a very thriving academic and indeed popular um, culture of medieval, um, the examination of medieval history and literature in Brittany itself, but it's sometimes difficult for that to percolate um, to the Anglo world the English speaking world, the Welsh speaking world to a lesser extent. Um, what I wanted to do as an introduction then um, is talk a little bit about things that are going on with the study of Brittany at the moment, because there's actually quite a bit going on in the UK. Um, what I have here is some useful publications about medieval Brittany. <clears throat> Excuse me, the first two arise from a four year project uh, based at the Department of Anglo-Saxon, North, North and Celtic at the University of Cambridge uh, from 2015 to 2019. Um, that project 
produced several conferences, um, a conference proceedings, which is the second, um, the second um, item there, and also an extraordinarily detailed and helpful book um, written by Caroline Brett with also the contributions from Fiona Edmonds and Paul Russell. That's the first item on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the list there. It's something like 5,000 pages long. It's very detailed. It's extremely well written. It's very, very accessible. And it goes into in great detail, um, a lot of really new and cutting edge research about Brittany, its position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the Celtic world, but also quite importantly, its position and its connections to what becomes continental France. So it covers a lot of different areas. It's extraordinarily um, useful. And I would suggest that anyone um, who wants to know anything about Brittany is very, very well served by looking at it, um, notwithstanding that it's extremely long and quite expensive. Although there is an e, there is an e version, it's probably cheaper. <clears throat> I'll also draw people's attention to uh, the third item, which is an article by Caroline Brett, which is actually quite um, quite old by now, relatively speaking, from 2010 in Canberra in Medieval Celtic Studies, um, which has an extraordinarily useful uh, summary of a lot of very important points. And finally, to the book edited by Lynette Olson, following on a conference in Sydney in Australia, um, devoted to Sounds and Sounds of Doll, and papers by Jonathan and myself, as well as other people, appear in that. <clears throat> Now, Brittany, of course, is part of the Roman Empire. It's um, part of now modern France. Um, it's the fairly remote parts of these, but it's also highly connected. And this is one of the things that I like to think about in my own work, and which figures um, very strongly in the various um, the various outputs from the um, ASNAC um, project as well. There are limited written sources before the year, say, 1100. Um, they're mostly saints' lives and charters. And uh, there are extraordinarily limited vernacular sources. So the sources that we have are mostly Latin. Um, Breton, of course, as everyone will know, is a Brythonic Celtic language. And this implies a very close connection between Brittany and Britain, with a considerable flow of influence from Britain to Brittany. <clears throat> In, in linguistic terms, and we will leave aside um, the question of what precisely a, a, the language that was spoken in what we could call Armorica before it came Brittany, probably a Celtic language, not my area of expertise. Um, it is now a, a, a very solidly Brythonic Celtic language that is spoken right now. From my point of view, one of the um, aspects of interest is that there's a considerable overlap in place name elements, which is another one of our great um, categories of evidence for um, early medieval Brittany. And the place name elements broadly speak to a similar, I'm going to generalize here, and this might get me into trouble, uh, broadly speak to a similar social organization. Um, and also in terms of our medieval place names, show shared or apparently shared cults of saints. And this figures heavily in, in um, the discussion of medieval, early medieval Breton history. It's largely what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> the relative scarcity of written sources from before 1100 means we rely heavily on hagiography. Um, and that the, a large proportion of our place names, our earliest place names, are connected one way or another to ecclesiastical organizations, we might call it, and are broadly speaking attached to people who we usefully consider as saints. <clears throat> and we don't really define saints very strictly at this point. <clears throat> this is both a blessing and a curse that, that saints and ecclesiastical organizations dominate. Um, things so much, partly because that's what the evidence is. And you're always asking, is that what the evidence is because it's so important, or have we overestimated it's important? And we continue to ask that. Um, there's a strong British and Welsh um, content of origin legends of Brittany and origin uh, pseudo historical uh, legends, as we might call them, especially the founding of Brittany from 
um, Britain by the Britons during the period of the fall of the Roman Empire and the coming of the Saxons. And the first real glimpse we get of this is in um, text from uh, Britain from ninth, such as the ninth century history of Britain, which we can we can locate fairly happily in the ninth century in North Wales, uh, but which has an afterlife that is enormous. Um, and this brings me to this particular slide, which is um, two art two items that I've written um, about Geoffrey of Monmouth. Now I, I apologize in advance. I'm talking about my own research. A lot of what I'm talking about is going to be things that I've um, written, which is embarrassing. But there it is. So Geoffrey of Monmouth figures very, very heavily in the impetus that he gives to the pseudo-historical accounts of Wales, Britain, and Brittany and the connections between them. Geoffrey was particularly interested in Brittany, sometimes for reasons that we can understand, sometimes for reasons that we sort of um, wish he didn't. But it's important to think as well that well before Geoffrey, this was already something that was in train. Um, so Geoffrey gave it new life, popularized it, gave it a lot of complicated details, but he, he absolutely did not invent it. And of course, what I say in my book, Geoffrey of Monmouth in the Writers of Wales series, and it's very important that Geoffrey's in that series because he is a writer of Wales and he's relying on Welsh tradition to a very large extent, although being Geoffrey, of course, he has to change everything. So if we turn to cults of saints and hagiographical texts, um, and again, this is a lot of stuff that I've written, which is, um, again, I apologize for. Um, some of this arises from the same project that I've been speaking about at the University of Cambridge, um, the first two items as well, um, publishing about the connections between Britain and Brittany mostly with respect to hagiographical texts. Um, there's an article about St. Samson of Dole, who is somewhat extraordinarily important in the, in the scheme of things. Um, and I'll talk about him a little bit in a minute. One of the interesting things about um, St. Samson of Dole is that he is supposedly, uh, and I think quite reliably from Wales, but there's almost no cult of him in Wales up until the very, very, very modern period. Um, and it's interesting to consider why that is. Um, there's also, I've put up a, an article about adjacent saints dedications, which mainly talks about the fact that in between Cornwall and Brittany and to a certain extent Wales, there are what look like shared cults of saints, but these have gone through many, many stages of invention, reinvention, identification, um, and what we're left with is a picture of something that's extraordinarily complicated uh, over a very long period of time. And that's partly what I'm talking about today in general, although not specifically with that material. Um, I've also put up there an article I wrote about um, the Cartulary of saint claude de Quimperle, which I probably won't specifically refer to, but it's useful to know that um, the Cartulary of saint claude de Quimperle figures very highly in um, some of the other things that I've that I've done, in terms of how we can trace in the 11th century or thereabouts, really distinctive connections between Wales and Brittany, and a, an absolutely an absolutely visible exchange of information from one place to the other. People are traveling back and forth between Wales and Brittany. They're interested in each other's well, some of them are <clears throat> in each other's um, literature, history, pseudo history, and the the particular the Cartier of Saint-Claude de Quimperle is one of the places where that shows up most visibly. It's also very much, very much resembles um, the Liber Landevensis, the Book of Clandaf, which is itself a, a 12th century Welsh production of considerable um, interest in terms of history, studio history, and also had geography. Um, so Saint-Claude de Quimperle will sort of lurk in the background. Um, as I say, the place names are one of our best sources for information for the earlier medieval period. Um, the cults of saints that are often shared between Brittany and Britain, or thought to be shared, broadly speaking, we can say, yes, there's considerable sharing, but as with all these things, the devil is always in the detail, and you have to look at each individual case as much as can be done 
and try to trace out how things happened, how things changed, how things changed, and then changed again, and then changed again. Now, the point of all of this is that, and if we look at the, um, at the uh, material coming out of the um, Cambridge project, we have discarded the model, uh, which runs very strongly through medieval and modern historiography. We've discarded the model that says saints from Britain went to Brittany and established Brittany as an effective colony of Britain, and specifically as saints, possibly slash missionaries or something like that. We've discarded that. And we look to bring nuance now to the implications of the shared language, the shared place names, the shared cults of saints. And um, there is clearly, and this is one of the things that I want to stress, there is clearly exchange of travel of people of information in both directions and over a long period of time. And that is one thing that um, it brings nuance to a lot of what we might think. Um, I have said already, of course, the texts that I'm dealing with are Latin texts exclusively, notwithstanding there are suggestions, or there have been suggestions, that possibly vernacular texts or even earlier Latin texts might lie behind some of what we have. But of course, we have to work with what we have. So <clears throat> if we look at some examples of contact between Britain and Wales in both directions over a long period of time, I'm going to be rather annoying and first of all talk about what I'm not going to talk about, um, but need mentioning. And the first of this is the life of St. Samson of Dole and the, the fact of, of St. Samson of Dole himself. <clears throat> this is the earliest um, Latin life of a British saint, Brythonic saint, um, who is said to have come from Wales, gone through Cornwall, gone to Brittany, and his life is composed in Brittany by a, a monk of Dole, which is his foundation in Brittany. But he, the author says he's using, and I, I honestly can't see any reason to disbelieve him in the, in the broad sense, all those, again, some of the details you might question. He says he's using materials gathered by um, himself in Wales and um, Cornwall. He seems, what he seems to have done is gone through some of the places that Samson is supposedly from, probably was from, I will say, and talked to people there and possibly gathered um, written text. Now, he also says he has access to a written text. This is the sort of thing our geographers sometimes say. Maybe we believe them, maybe we don't. Um, but there is an argument that says, even if we can't retrieve all of its, all of its precise details, there may be, there may well be, and I, I, I agree with this, there may well be an earlier text line behind this relatively early text as well. When we say relatively early, possibly as early as the seventh century, which for our purposes is very early. There's considerable discussion about the date of his first life, but it's there's less there's less controversy about it than there used to be. People are more willing now to accept that it might be early. It's just we don't get what we mean by early. So, and it's interesting as well to note that all the manuscripts of the first life of St. Samson are continental. But at some point, this particular version, because there were rewritings of, um, on a second life and, and onwards. At some point, a version of this first life was in Wales and was adapted into the Book of Llandaff in, in the Niverland Avensis. It hasn't left any trace in the manuscripts. It has, it, it's one of those things where we know it was accessible, possibly it traveled, we're not sure how, and it was certainly there, um, but we don't know too much about it. So that's the first big area of interest is, is Samson, his lives, and the way they get, um, the way they get carried around. The second also, which I'm not going to talk about, which, but which I have published about, and, and of course Samson as well, um, is the life of St. Cada by the Fris of Flancarban, which is thought to be late 11th century. One of the earliest, um, one of the earliest lives, Latin lives of Welsh saints, if we leave out whatever existed for Samson. Um, there's, there's two very early lives. One, the other one is Hrdoar, like St. David. And again, I won't go into the details, but there's a very strong argument that this text, The Life of Hannah by Lippus, shows a considerable and a quite traceable exchange of information in both directions um, between uh, Lippus, one assumes, and Plancarban, and Kemperle, which is where the cartilage of Kemperle is from. Uh, we see this, I think it's fair to argue, in the episodes in the life of Hannah, which talk very specifically about 
a cult of Cadog in Brittany. Um, I'll spoil everything by saying it's probably not Cadog, but it doesn't really matter because we can, we can, the medieval authors can say, we like to think, or we do think that this is Cadog, so it's all grist for our mill. Um, so it's quite clear that someone from Llancarvan, possibly Lucas himself, was in Camp LA and looking at things on the ground and describing them in, in quite accurate detail and attributing them to a saint who probably had the similar name to Cadog, but wasn't Cadog, doesn't matter. The other part of this is that the Cartulary of Camp LA contains a life of its founding saint, uh, the, the saint they chose to, it's a bit like the Book of Llandaff, they chose to invent saints to be their founders. Um, and this is uh, Gerthier, who could be um, thought of as Vortiger, which is basically the same name. Um, in this life, in the Cartulaire Gempele, there is an enormous amount of material, including genealogical material, that really shall have come from Wales. Um, and it's very closely connected to the story of Bretonians. And this is partly why I include um, my slightly, um, my slightly out of date article there because it goes through it in very great detail. It's an incredibly interesting life and it does show an interchange of information. Um, so that's the things I'm not going to talk about. <clears throat> the things I am going to talk about, um, and I'm looking for things that are of particular interest to colleagues interested in Welsh, especially Welsh language um, texts, is um, this. Um, it's quite complicated, and I, I refer you again for the um, for the detail of a lot of this and my two most recent publications. This particular, this is one instance of many uh, where I was trying to trace information in, in saints' lives composed in Brittany um, before 1100 and information that purported or is from Britain. So this is from... Um, Ordestan's Life of St. Winwalo, or Genole, um, which is written in the later ninth century. And Winwalo, the, the subject of the life, is given a British origin, as, as very many Breton saints um, are, but not all of them. His mother, his father, and his two brothers cross the sea from Britain to Brittany because of a plague, we're told. And Winwalo is born um, in Brittany once they arrive there. Now, if we look at the connections and keeping in mind, this is a ninth century text from Brittany. Um, so one of the things is that you ask is what information is there? Can we think about where they got the information? And also equally importantly, what what's the afterlife of this information? Um, where does it go? And keeping in mind that of course, lives of saints and saints families within those lives can very easily, in fact, proactively be, um, I won't say manipulated, that's not the right word, but can be identified with other people for various reasons, some of which are political, some of which are what we might call literary. Um, so it's, it's, all, it's all a changing world. So if we look at Winwell's um, connections in this life, he has a father, Frakan. Um, now, Frakan, uh, I have not put in any color there because he is not otherwise, as far as I can tell, known to any Welsh tradition. He doesn't show up anywhere else. The people who have colorful bits do. Um, he does. Although he shows up, he has a, a sort of a further life in Breton tradition, but we're not worried about that. We're told his cousin is Catovius, the king of the Britons, and he's Catovius is in blue. There, the bright blue. Um, we have a Catovius Filius Gerontius um, who shows up in a genealogy of someone called Rewal. Um, interestingly enough, and slightly frustratingly, this is not a genealogy that shows up in the Welsh text, and it's not even a genealogy that shows up in a Breton text. It shows up in the life of Winnock, who um, has a name similar to Winwalo and gets confused with him, but probably in the well, probably the same thing, um, who shows up in 10th or 11th century Flanders. And there's a, there are, in fact, two lives composed there about Winock. He has a Celtic name. We're told that he traveled um, from Britain um, with three companions, were given their names, 
Uh, we can't really identify their names, but they seem British. So there's this saint in Flanders who has this, this um, sort of British, unusual British backstory. Um, and one of the people that shows up in a genealogy contained in the text from Flanders about him is this, is, well, I won't say this Catobius, it's a Catobius. Um, we don't know if it's the same one. It's Catobius, Phileas, Gerontius, who knows. Um, now, Peter Bartram identified this Catobius quite understandably with a character called Cadriac Geraint, who shows up in Kielich Bowen and Breuder Knop von Abel. Fair enough. Um, I have an enormous amount of respect for Peter Bartram and his work, and it makes all our lives extremely more pleasant and easy. He's a bit like Wikipedia. You sort of start there and you don't take any of it too seriously, but it's an enormous, helpful accumulation of material. So when he makes identifications, you don't necessarily take on board the identifications, but you certainly take on board the fact that there seem to be like named people um, in this quite wide um, universe that takes in Flanders, Brittany, and, and possibly medieval Wales um, at the period in which Welsh language texts are being written down at any rate. So, and we're not necessarily sure what to do with any of this, but we, but we note it. So that is Catobius with the blue, and you'll notice he doesn't, um, he doesn't show up too many more times. Um, we meet some other characters, or like named characters, and that's an important distinction in later Breton sources. So Wethenoch, um, Winwolo's brother, um, who is in the yellow, and Jacobus or Yakut, who is in red, they're both brothers, they're twin brothers of um, Winwolo. Um, there's someone at um, the Abbey of saint Yacut de la Mer in Brittany, composed a life of these two twin brothers at a slightly later date. And it seems, it's not entirely clear, but it seems that possibly what happened was a Jacobus and, and Wethenoch, his brother, became identified for whatever reason, possibly good reasons, possibly not, with the Yakut of the saint Yacut de la Mer, the patron of the Abbey, and someone decided, here are these, here are these ready-made people, that's right, the life of them. So the life of them that exists is really very heavily derivative of the life of their more important and more famous brother. This gets a bit complicated when we consider that Wethnock, and you'll notice there's quite a bit of yellow um, scattered throughout here. Um, Wethnock, the brother of Winwolo, or someone with the same name, has a very important um, cult in Cornwall, um, not in Wales, but in Cornwall. So we have in Cornwall a 10th century list of Cornish saints, um, which is extremely interesting. It's just, it's just a bunch of names. And then um, Oliver Paddle and Lynette, Lynette Olson um, worked very hard in, in gathering all the information about them, connecting them as, as far as could be done to particular places and other um, literary texts, things like that. So Wethenoch is one of these people that shows up in this 10th century list. He also shows up in the life of, well, the lives, both of them, of St. Petroc. And he is given as Petroc's predecessor at his main cult site, which is Padstow. What seems to have happened is that Padstow was previously known as Lanwethenek, which is the church of St. Wethenek, and Wethenoch was found and inserted into the lives of St. Petroc in order to explain <coughs> this change of name. And it does it in a very typical hydrographical fashion. It says, Petroc shows up, Wethenoch says, here I am, I've been waiting for you. Take my monastery because you're very important and I'm not. So Wethenoch, and whether or not this is connected to the Wethenoch in a 10th century list, the lives of Petroc are 11th and 12th century um, at the earliest. Whether or not these are all actually the same people, and we have stopped asking that question, they are either thought to be the same people or it has been decided it's useful to think of them as the same people, which again is a slightly different thing. Um, in these texts about Wethenoch in Cornwall, I mean, he's not really the 
he's not really the main character. He's not given any family. So who's ever writing, for example, the lives of St. Petrov doesn't say this is Wethenok, who was the very famous Winwellow's brother. And Winwellow has a cult in Cornwall as well, although maybe it's a person who knows. So Wethenok sort of shows up in isolation in Cornwall. Um, I've almost gone through my colors. The, one of the more interesting ones is um, Wethenok's, uh, sorry, Winwell as well, and Wethenok as well, mother. And she is given in the ninth century Breton text, the Latin Breton text, as Alba Tremanis. Now, Alba has, as you can probably tell, three breasts because she has three sons. Um, the life of Wethenok and Yakut, which is late, slightly later and derivative of this life, amplify this. They say, lingua patria guen appellata quod latine sonat candida, which is to say, um, in the language of their country, she's called Gwen because this means white or glowing or whatever, which is what Alba means and which is what Gwen means. So this brings us to Gwen Teobron, who occurs in the Welsh genealogy of Ona the Sand, 12th century or thereabouts. Um, now, one of the interesting things about Gwen Terbron is that in Bonne de Sand, in the Welsh genealogical texts, she has a lot of Breton connections, but they are completely different ones. They're not the ones to do with Winwellow and his family. Um, I'm not entirely sure why in some cases, but it tells us a little bit about the transmission of information, the identification of names, the ability of, of people to find things in isolation and possibly group them together as they like or not. Um, and of course, this is very, very, very characteristic of genealogy. The genealogy does things like this. It finds people, it puts them together for various reasons. And I will say right now that hagiography, and here I will use the C word Celtic hagiography, absolutely does this, much more than other kinds of hagiography. Um, Celtic hagiography, and I include um, Welsh, uh, Cornish, Breton, and Irish, um, is very, very, very interested in making these connections in, and specifically with respect to gene genealogy. And of course, other hagiographical traditions are interested in genealogy, but no, nowhere near to the same extent. And this is one of the reasons, one of the several reasons, but one of the reasons why I've always defended the use of Celtic when we're talking about hagiography in particular. It's not appropriate to talk about it in, in every sense, in every case of every kind of cultural historical um, um, issue, but hagiography, I think, is, is very clearly a place where you can do that. So Gwen Terbron um, has in Bonne de Saint, um, she's the daughter of Emil Chidal, and people will perk up their ears at this because Chidal is Brittany in the Welsh language, although I'll come to that in a minute. She's the wife of Aeneas the Dewig of Chidal, so he's twice Breton, I would say. Um, she's also the mother of Cadvan of Entry, who I put in the purple just at the bottom. And we'll note that a Cadvan is named in the life of St. Cadarn, and again, a Latin text from, say, 12th century Wales. He's named as one of the two leaders of monks who come from Latavia, which is clearly Brittany in that text, to Wales with Cadarn. And of course, it's interesting as well that Cadarn is said to, to have come from Brittany. Um, and if you look at my other publications, you'll, you'll see more discussion of that. So when Teobron's Breton connections are pretty well attested, um, but in the Welsh text, there's no mention of her supposed husband, Fracam. There's no mention of uh, Winwallow, her son, who is very well known in Brittany and has a cult in Cornwall, but not Wales. There's no mention of Wethenoch, who has a cult in Cornwall, um, and again, not a cult in Wales, and given an entirely, as I say, different set of relatives who are also Breton, which we'll go over and over again in the case of one of them. Now, I, I will digress a little bit and say Peter Bartram um, had an explanation for why um, or how none of these people who come from Hidal in texts such as Bonnet the Said actually came from Brittany. He thought they came from a place in Wales um, called Hidal. Um, I think that is very much special pleading. 
And I think we would not necessarily, um, I certainly don't um, agree with that. And it was, a, it was an argument driven by not so much what the evidence tells us, but by the idea that our Welsh saints did not come from Brittany. It's the other way around, it's the other direction. The direction of travel is from north to south, not south to north. Well, as far as the medieval hagiographers at least were concerned, it could be both, I think is absolutely fair to say. And if we look at, for example, the life of St. Padarn, which is composed in Wales in the 12th century, okay, there might be an earlier life, we're not going to worry about that because we cannot find or prove it. But um, it says it says very, very directly that Padarn comes from Brittany and he, it says Armorica, there's no, there's no confusion in that text for what that term means. However, might you, however else you might like to interpret the text, uh, the, the term in Welsh text, which, which I don't know. So I think we can throw out Bartram's theory that every time you hear Fidal in Welsh text, with respect to people who you'd really like to have come from Wales, that the text is telling you that, that they did because they didn't necessarily. So we have the sorts of connections the sorts of loss of connections, the sorts of reconnections, the sorts of inventions. As I say here, as characterized our genealogy, we find this in our hagiographical texts, and not just in texts, but in, in cults in general, because hagiography is sort of a textual um, category, and, and cults of saints encompass other things um, other than written text. Um, we're not asking who these people originally are. We have completely stopped asking that. We can't answer that. We're not asking even who the literary and genealogical and hagiographical creators of tradition thought that they were, or we're not asking them to be consistent in that either. We understand that, that this is a, a living tradition, like, like pseudo-history. This is, this is genealogy and hagiography and pseudo-history have an enormous amount in common. What we are doing is taking out that these identifications span the channel quite easily, and we, of course, include Cornwall in our Wales, Cornwall, Brittany nexus. Um, now I'm just very briefly going to move on to one final and quite interesting um, um, example, which is the case of another, another Breton life, the life of St. Paul Aurelian um, by Ormanoc. And again, it's um, ninth century, I don't think I put it that word, but it's ninth century. So around the same time as um, the life of Winwillow, it is a very interesting text. It contains a lot of names, surnames, place names, explained and translated. Um, we're not entirely sure what this means. At more than one point, the author says he has heard these things from Transmarini, which is to say people from overseas, who knows. It gives us, um, for example, the earliest instance of St. David's epithet, Aquaticus, um, is found in that text. And of course, we'll note for St. David that the earliest uh, evidence for his existence comes in an Irish text. So St. David has a very complicated and widespread um, um, ambit. So in this text, just, just to concentrate on what we're interested in here, just before Paul Aurelian leaves Britain for Brittany, because he's one of these ones that does that, he meets a ruler who's called Mark. And Ormanoc describes him as Marcus alio nomine comoros. Now Mark, and the, if this is the same character. Mark is very well known from the Tristan material, and Oliver Paddle has described him as a pan britannic character of folklore. Connemore is probably several figures, um, again a sort of stock figure of, of folklore, and he shows up in a lot of saints' lives, Breton saints' lives, so he's sort of familiar with about things and needs to be overcome. Someone of that name also is mentioned in Gregory of Tours' Historia Francor, and so he's got quite a I say he as if he's one person. That that character has quite a, a reliable um, historical existence, however, much be connected to this. The question becomes how and why did Ormanoc, the author of this life, link these two names? They mark at another name. Um, and Oliver Paddle has suggested with incredible diffidence, um, and I have suggested with less diffidence because I'm willing to go out on a limb. Uh, but it was originally his suggestion, or I wouldn't even say suggestion, his argument, um, that possibly what has happened is linked to an inscribed stone in Cornwall at Castle Dora. This inscribed stone, um, and I'll come to, no, 
I didn't. Yes, the, the, it's slightly hidden by the uh, thing there, but you can see the um, you can see the inscription as it's worked out. In this case, by Charles Thomas in his and how these mute stones speaks. Not everyone agrees with all the you know how these are reconstituted. Um, and then the expansion, Drustan as Hikyak at Carmel as Filius. So Drustan um, lies here, the son of Carmel. So there's a stone in Cornwall linking Connemore, someone of that name, to someone of a name resembling Tristan. And we could extrapolate that the connection between Mark and Connemore that Ormanoff makes is possibly linked to someone having seen the stone in Cornwall, which links not Mark and Connemore, but a Mark associated figure. You can see how this is a fairly fancy suggestion. But it's actually quite compelling. So it's a very, very big if. But if if you if you thought that this could possibly happen, this would mean that Romanov or someone who who was his informant had seen something in the on the ground in Cornwall, related it and connected it in this hagiographical text. So I'm I'm finishing up there by saying we need to think very carefully about our preconceptions about how people and information travel, in which directions. How many times things can cross and recross the channel, possibly changing in the, in the process. And very possibly, as we can have suggested by some of the genealogical material, um, sometimes the connections are made and all you have is the connection you have, you can't trace the process by which this happened. And of course, as the as the stone here, if if we agree with this, suggests to us we also have to consider non-textual sources in the wider world of these sorts of things. So I'm finishing up there. I have no idea what time it is, Simon. I apologize if I've gone over. I don't think you have. Thank you very much.